So how important is it to have good theology in our corporate worship? Well, hopefully in our congregations when we do gather and, and worship together corporately, theology is informing everything that happens from beginning to end. So the matters of who is God, who is man, who is Christ, and how we respond to that, from first to last of a liturgy, of a gathering of the church, ultimately theology is informing and shaping our congregations around what we are ascribing to be true in song and prayer and readings. So narrow that down to music itself. What are we doing to shape our music to make sure that in content and substance and balance and so on, we really do reflect the Word of God in song? Well, I think when we look at the, the Bible and, and, the, and the Psalms, for example, in the songbook, the two most stark things we find as both breadth and depth. So in other words, in other words to, to, you, you find a God of wrath and a God of peace and a God who is a judge than a God who is loving or compassionate. And, and so that, that wonderful breadth um, uh, it nourishes our mind and our soul and gives us a, a realistic picture of the God of the Bible. The, the danger we have in our generation to write songs that, that, that appeal uh, on a first time listen is that probably only 15% of those subjects spoken at at a very shallow level have an instant appeal to people. So I think that's why it has to inform. Other, otherwise, we, we create this, we create a God in our own convenient mm. image. I know people of a slightly older generation, so sort of a 35 and 40 and up, older than, older to, older to than you. Older than yourself. I'm but, even included but, in that group. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but not my generation and, I and down believe, a bit. I cannot believe I'm a 35 to 40. Well, yes, 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 yes. You're, you're just about okay. over the hill. But what, what I was going to say, I know a lot of people in that generation who say that much of their theology that they have picked up, they have actually picked up from the breadth and sweep of Christian hymns in the past. Right. Is this generation going to be shaped by contemporary songs? Well, every generation is shaped by them, whether they like it or not. Um, that's the tragedy, and I think that's what the calling is for our generation, both for pastors and for artists. Let me write the songs of the nation, and I care not who writes its laws. That's exactly right. I can think even me from growing up, though, the most formative songs were, you know, there is a fountain filled with blood, and on Christ's solid rock I stand, and uh, from Watts to, to Fanny Crosby being very shaped and informed by, um, by the lyrics we were singing together as a church. And so even in the younger demographic of the age you prescribed, growing up in a church that would be akin to that demographic, of course led by, you know, 50 plus, um, extremely shaped by, that is why it is so vital that, that the church is producing and writing new hymns that do teach theology to our people. You say new hymns, what place do we have for rejuvenating old hymns, picking the best of them and rejuvenating them again too. They're, do we have to start from zero in every generation? No, absolutely not. And I think with every change of, with every change of communication, there are things gained and things lost. Mm -hmm. So for example, hymn books replaced essentially memory. Mm -hmm. So I think, I'm sure many people, many great saints were concerned that they memorized all these songs and suddenly they were put down every brand. I think they did lose something, but they gained something else by the breadth of songs they were able to have with the hymn book. But similarly, the hymn book's transition to modern worship music um, ha has taken away something of the breadth and actually something of the humility and the sense of the universal church that you could sing the great hymns of the church fathers, the great settings of the, of the Jewish Psalms, they said the, 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 the songs of the reformers, the revivalists, and the people who changed. And as with every generation, as with every continent, as with every human being, each of those display nuances, strengths, weaknesses that we today stand on the shoulders of and can learn from. So I think to lose all of that history uh, is an incredibly dangerous thing for our generation. The, the, the revival that many of the Gospel Coalition leaders have seen in theology in our generation didn't actually happen because they just got back into the Word of God. Mm. It's because they discovered and learned from leaders of previous generations. Um, and right now, musicians neither have that humility nor that wisdom. So let me ask a, a slightly presumptuous question. What do you and Christian and, Kristen and Stuart Townend do in terms of choosing topics? Do you think through at some point, what Christian themes have we been overlooking? What, what themes have we ignored or uh, that we're not singing about that we should, we should pay more attention to? Do you, do, you, do you think about things like that? Sure, well, I guess there's two answers to that. The, the, in, in terms of our own short biography, 
we began um, just in the frustration of group Bible studies of trying to set the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. Cecil Francis Alexander, mm -hmm. who came from right. the same county as myself and the same country as your daddy, um, set, was so concerned about, about theological understanding among children mm -hmm. that she wrote the, the Apostles' Creed to music, mm -hmm. and out of which we get There is a Green Hill Far Away, we get All Things Bright and Beautiful, we get Once in a Row David City. Songs that we've now shortened that were written for children because mm -hmm. she was concerned about the theological content of them in the 19th century. So we began with that and that was where the first collection in Christ Alone and Part of the Cross and, and so on came from. And then from that we expanded it to, to looking, I'm probably more, I'm very prone to liturgy. So I, I thought looking through a service of worship, looking through the church's year, And so we began to fill in the gaps of liturgy. And then two years ago, we took on another project called Hymns for the Christian Life, which was looking at subjects like work, um, the, the social needs of those around us, you know, mm -hmm. fellowship uh, and reconciliation, all these, and, and so I did that. So ours has been that way. But I think, I think every church want to make sure that the, the, the broad doctrine of God, even, to, even an exercise like reading the contents page of, of Packers Knowing God, was one of the first things that made me think mm -hmm. we need to do that, but, but, but it's the responsibility of every pastor, Don. It's not, you know, I, I write songs, Matt writes songs, there's a lot of young guys trying to write songs, but it's the responsibility of every pastor to feed his congregation a, a balanced diet and to oversee what is being sung, even if he's not picking all the songs, mm -hmm. and to settle letter, leadership that says this is so vitally important to my people. I've got a, a friend who's pastor, in fact, he's a member of, of, of the council, I might as well uh, mention his name. Um, he, 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 he serves a church in uh, southern Wisconsin, And um, uh, one of the things he likes to stress is that his criteria for what songs to pick uh, is not mere orthodoxy, mm -hmm. but what is the most excellent thing that he can find on the theme in question. Mm -hmm. So what do we do to demand excellence in our corporate worship, including our singing? What are the practical steps we take My hope is, as a worship leader and as a songwriter, is that I would be approaching a text or a new hymn or an old hymn, whatever the choice be, um, and thinking of it like a pastor. So I'm, I'm approaching a text and either writing a new hymn as an exposition of this text. I can even think back like so, looking at the scope of songs, um, seeing how many modern songs are focused in on the love of God, and so trying to pull back the scope there and say, Yes, God is love, but there are many elements to his character and nature that need to be addressed in modern song. So God's omniscience, God's omnipresence, God's omnipotence. Mm -hmm. Specifically reading Packer's uh, lectures on penal substitutionary atonement that Mark Dever put together. I remember just with a friend early on, giving him a copy of that and me reading it, us reading it together, and then writing a theological response to something substantive. And so I think even with our own congregation wanting to continually feed my own soul and write songs out of engaging not pop Christian books, but books of substance and books of, 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 of uh, depth and richness and be able to ex exposit those truths, exegeting those truths and putting them into melody, putting them into something that would be memorable. Yeah, and what, one of the things my friend uh, does is keep a list of the best things he can find on this subject, that subject, the other stuff, and so many other things then that are produced. The number of new songs being produced is prodigious. Uh, just fall away. They, in other words, the, the, they don't get onto his list of excellence, and the excellence has got to be musical and theological and balance of things, and even quality of lyrics. If I can stick my oar in, one of the things I like about the Town and Getty thing is that um, Among you, you're developing uh, a good ear for poetry, for literary um, creativity. It, it sounds fresh. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to churn out sort of orthodox theology. It's not easy to write stuff that says old things in, in, in new and creative ways. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the, the great contributions that the Getty Town team has <laughs> Well, has between, made. between my wife, Kristen, and Stuart, and the two of you, I'm probably the least qualified of all to speak about lyrics. Um, except, to get back to your point, to say that we have to remember that it is art. Art yeah, is, it is the creation, the production, the expression of, of beauty. And while we, we'll talk further, obviously, about, 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 about melody, it's worth saying that, that if, if a, even at this point, that if a melody is not outstandingly memorable, then you're wasting your time trying to force it in congregations. And um, in, in, the same way as, in the same way as we don't go to a restaurant 
um, because it's edible. We go to a restaurant because the food's phenomenal. Because we because our, our our mouths are watering at the idea of going there tonight. Do you know what I mean? And so, and so I think, I think I I, I think to get back to you, it's important that those of us who come from a conservative thing and where our primary concern and, and worry and fear and hope for our congregation is that the word of Christ dwells in them richly. It's important to remember that this also is not it's not sermonizing. It's creating a beautiful art form, which our people will run through their heads for years to come. And when people like my grandfather turn 94 and have lost their mind and call me Clive, they still know great hymns of the faith because, because they have become so much part of their And all of it person. offered up to God and building up the church and the memory of the church, the heritage of the church, the confessionalism of the church. Thanks.